What I'm encouraged by is the fact that CBO said, yes, we hit our budget target and then some. What I'm encouraged is what the CBO says is we're going to be able to drop premiums. If the government's going to stop forcing people to buy something that they don't want to buy, then they won't buy it. And that's basically what CBO is saying. No, no, no. that's actually to totally wrong. What the Congressional Budget Office found when it finally got the chance to evaluate the Obamacare repeal bill three weeks after Ryan forced it through the House was that in 10 years, 23 million more people will be uninsured than if Congress left the Affordable Care Act alone. Not because they're choosing not to buy insurance, as Ryan claims, but because in some states, insurance would become too expensive to afford, especially for the poor and the already sick. Meanwhile, Trump in absentia proposed his new budget this week, one that would gut safety net programs in order to give tax cuts to the rich. And if that sounds almost cartoon villain cruel, you haven't heard anything yet. For years and years, uh, we've simply looked at a budget in terms of the folks who are on the, the back end of the programs, the recipients of, of the taxpayer money, and we haven't spent nearly enough time focusing our attention on the people who pay the taxes. Compassion needs to be on both sides of that equation. Yes, you have to have compassion for folks who are receiving the federal funds, but also you have to have compassion for the folks who are paying it. <laughs> All right, my panel is back with me, and uh, I want to start off, and I want to come right to you on this, Kate and Dawson, because the CBO did finally get a chance to evaluate this, uh, this health care bill that uh, the Republicans managed to get through the House, which is supposedly DOA in the Senate. And what it said is that if you waive the pre-existing condition rules, as, the, as Mick Mulvaney and Donald Trump and Paul Ryan want to do, people who are less healthy, including those with pre-existing or newly acquired medical conditions, would ultimately be unable to purchase insurance at premiums comparable to those under current law, if they could purchase it at all, despite the additional funding that would be available to help reduce premiums. How can Republicans justify a bill that would bounce 23 million people off insurance? Does anybody in their right mind really believe 23 million Americans would simply choose not to be insured? Let me start before I get started on this is, <laughs> at the end of the day, I've been very consistent. The party that owns the health care bill is usually the party that loses, except for the guy at the top, which was Barack Obama. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is something, I can't say that it's unfixable or unrepairable, but both of these plans start crashing under their own weight. I don't see the future for Obamacare at all because of the way it blows the budget out and the amount wait, of wait, money that's spent. Hold, hold, hold I don't see, I don't see any second. success hold, on the Republican wait, side. Hold on one second, and you're my friend, but I'm gonna, I have to interrupt you on that because the only jeopardy to Obamacare right now, there's two. One, that the Trump administration could pull the money that has been pledged to supplement people's premiums, which Donald Trump has threatened to do, and the fact that the uncertainty created by the constant threatening to defund those exchanges, to defund the subsidies people get to for insurance are causing insurance companies to jump out of the market or to raise premiums. So it's actually Republicans that are threatening the future of the Affordable Care Act, not to mention, my friend, the fact that you had Republican governors all over this country, including, and I'm going to come to Fernand on this next, refuse, in Florida, refuse to cover their own citizens with Medicaid despite a 100% match from the federal government. So you can't say that Obamacare is imploding. The CBO says it's not. It's the Republicans trying to kill it. Why is your party trying to take people's health care. I think one of the things we've seen, much like the Kansas, Kansas didn't come up uh, uh, where, where Blue Cross Blue Shield is pulled out of those markets. I think it's the affordability, the insurance companies that are there, and, and just the main, where's the money going to come from in the future? These 2017 triggers that came in under Obamacare came in on purpose. They came in after the president left office. Uh, so I, again, what I'll state is, I'm not sure it's all curable. And I'm not sure the Republican plan, which is out of the House, is certainly not going to look like the same thing out of the Senate. Uh, McConnell said he doesn't think he can garner the votes it takes to pass it. So we're probably going to be stuck with Obamacare, like it or not. Well, 20 the million people that go got insurance are like telling the Lord, thank you, if that is the case. Um, <laughs> Fernand, you know, let, let's play Mick Mulvaney, who, you know, I wrote a, a piece for the Daily Beast this week talking about the sort of almost cartoonish wow. cruelty, um, not just of the, the Republican at the top, not just of Donald Trump for changing his mind on, on taking care of people, but also, you know, of the voters who go along with this. But right in the middle of that is Mick Mulvaney, who's actually not embarrassed about the cruelty that he's putting forward. This is Mick Mulvaney at the White House on Tuesday talking about cutting social, social security disability payments. 
Will any of those individuals who presently receive SSDI receive less as a result of this budget? I hope so. I, 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 if there are people who are getting SSDI who should not be getting it. Those people who should be getting it, oh no. they receive less. Oh no, if people, if people are, are really disabled. We are not kicking anybody off of any program who really needs it. Fernand? <sighs> Joey, we can play all the clips from the Trump administration in the world that still doesn't make their Kafka-esque logic justifiable. Think of this as a parent complaining about their malnourished child, only to discover that the parent is withholding sustenance for that child. That's why they're malnourished. And what you hear folks like Kate and Dawson said, who otherwise are very respectable, patriotic American citizens, does not justify what's going on in any way, shape, or form. I look at what's taking place here in South Florida. We have the most enrollees into the Affordable Care Act of any place in the nation. And as you point out, Republican representatives Carlos Curbelo and Mario diaz Balart voted for this plan that will throw off the two districts in America with the most enrollees. Joy, this is not just cruel. This is lethal, and it continues to be lethal because an administration that has no credibility will not offer any answers to solve the problem. They're only going to exacerbate this crisis. And, you know, Jonathan, you had Donald Trump. Let's play Donald Trump because this is during his announcement that he was going to run for president. This is what he said. Said to the people who were going to vote for him. Take a listen. Save Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security without cuts. Have to do it. Get rid of the fraud, get rid of the waste and abuse, but save it. Okay, so he said they would not cut Medicaid, and he mm -hmm. said multiple times they would, they, would, they would not cut Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Mick Mulvaney updating Donald Trump's promises uh, on, Tuesday, on Monday. He went down the list. Yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes, no, no. Okay? And the, yes and the no's, well, in the stuff that's in the budget. And we'll talk about that. We'll, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. The no's were all Social Security and Medicare. That's it. I mean, that was, that's, he said, I promised people on the campaign trail I would not touch uh, their retirement and I would not touch Medicare, and we don't do it. He's just denying what we just heard Donald Trump yeah. say. Yeah, I, look, this is a prime <laughs> example of what I've been saying from the, from the very beginning uh, of the Trump administration, which is you really can't trust what they're saying. Right. until they actually do it. Yeah. And so, you know, the president out there on the campaign trail when he was a candidate said, I'm not going to do it, not going to do it, not going to mm -hmm. do it. And now here's this budget that says, well, yeah, well, yeah, we don't do it. Yeah. Um, and so until Congress actually gets yeah. through and does the budget process, will we see whether we can take the president as, at his word as a candidate, or do we listen to the budget director who says, no, we're going to cut it. Yeah, and at the same time, Corrine, yeah. you know, we just had a, in this Montana special election where the marquee thing was, the be was beating up a reporter. Right. But underneath that was this question of whether the Republicans supported doing all of these things to their, his own citizens, cutting their Medicaid. Right. And by the way, he did support support cutting the Medicaid, he still won. D putting aside the violence, voters on the Republican side seem to be okay with this, even if it's going to hurt them. And that's the thing that I don't understand, because if you look at the budget, if you look at Trump care, the people that it hurts the most are his people, mm -hmm. yeah. are those folks that we're talking about in the rust, that, 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 that rust belt. And so it doesn't make any sense. On the budget, it is a moral document, right? This is a wish list. At the, like you were right. saying, Congress is going to ultimately decide what happens, but this is your wish list, taking away SNAPs, uh, cutting meals on wheels, uh, cutting and not funding Social Security Disability Fund. I mean, this is what they are, they are proposing from that White House. And on, the, and on the, uh, the Trump care, Trump care is actually death care. That's really what they should call it. They are, they are cutting Medicaid by $800 billion, but giving tax, tax cuts to the millionaires and billionaires of $900 billion, yeah. and, and it's the survival of the richest. It, That's it, what they're doing. It is a puzzle. It is a conundrum. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we, we need to really suss it out. The polling on it is really bizarre. Um, uh, but. We're going to leave it right there and talk about something that is actually some very, very sad news. You know, these are times when we really do need great data and great pollsters. Uh, and we have some very sad news for our viewers. Sergio Ben Dixon, who's a pioneering pollster, uh, he's actually Fernand's friend, business partner, mentor, died on Friday at the age of 68. Uh, and Fernand, I know that uh, this was somebody who was very important to you. I want to give you an opportunity to just, for our viewers who don't know about Sergio Ben Dixon, tell us a little bit about your friend. Sergio was truly a pioneer and someone who changed this country 
uh, for the better. Uh, understanding and, and, and recognizing the importance of the demographic shifts that were taking place in the United States and giving those people a voice who never before in terms of polling, uh, we only saw English language polling that was the tradition as the country changed and became more multilingual. Sergio introduced polling in language of preference which allowed them to be represented in public opinion for the first time. A, a true pioneer, someone who uh, devoted his life not only to this country but to the, to the premise of a allowing people to have their opinion expressed, not special interest, but going to the people themselves. I think it's a tremendous legacy and one that will be missed and, and one, one that we need in this country going forward, Joy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, we should note that Ben Dixon and Amandi, the, the firm that uh, Fernand and uh, Sergio worked for, was the first to be able to go into Cuba. Uh, and I can tell you that is not an easy thing to do to go in and conduct <laughs> polls there. Um, so you guys have done great work, and he will certainly be missed. So our condolences to you, Fernand, uh, and to all of the people who loved and knew Sergio Ben Dixon. Thank you all. All right. And Jonathan and Kareen will be back. Thank you to Kate and Dawson and Fernand Amandi. Thank you guys. All right. And there's more AM Joy up next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.